yeah, so what it, what it actually means going from eye contains to search. In this talk, I would actually like to tackle the distinction between filtering and searching and what search actually is. It's going to be a more theoretical talk, what's, what's actually behind it, how it works, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to draw some implications into what it actually means for the actual performance and the use cases. For the more uh, concrete stuff using Elasticsearch, that will actually uh, be tomorrow. I'll have a talk on how to integrate Python and Django with, uh, with Elasticsearch. This is mostly theory that can be applied to uh, any and all uh, search engines. So I said th theory. So any, any good theory, and sometimes even the bad ones, start with some definitions. So uh, let's define what search is for us. So for me and, and for, for the purposes of this talk, search is any interface to data, anything where you, need, where you have some data set, and then you need to sort of explore and find what's, what's in there. And there is a difference between exploring and finding, and we'll deal with that a little bit later, but just shortly, uh, when you know what you're looking for, then it's search. When you don't know what you're looking for, you wanna know what's there, that's sort of the exploration part. And that part is often more interesting. So if I asked you to implement a search, how would, how would you do it? How do people do it? So uh, typical, the first uh, response is, I, I'll just go through it. So if I'm looking for a book in my library that, that mentions Django, I'll, I'll pull, it, pull them out one after another, and I'll read them. And I'll set all those that actually mentions Django aside. If I have a files, I will do the same, but just using grep, so it'll be much faster, but still not ideal. And many people do, if I have a database, I'll just, I'll just run the, the iContains query. And that's essentially the same thing. What this means is I'm going through all my books in my database, I'm going through all the text, and I'm looking for Django in there. So you can see that that doesn't really scale because indices in the database doesn't help us. Grep will still have to read almost every single byte in the file. Well, that's not really true because grep is amazing, but still it will have to sequentially go through the files. And I don't even have to tell you how much work it would be to read uh, all the books in your library, at least I hope. I, I do hope that you people read. You should, it's awesome. So clearly this is not the way to go. But someone must have had this problem before. Clearly, we're not the first one, not even the first generation to think about search. If you think that way, you're actually correct. We already solved this. Uh, when you're reading a book, you can, you can list to the end sometimes, and you will see an index. You will see an index that actually points you to where the relevant terms occur in the book. This is a data structure that first occurs in the 1200s in a small monastery in Europe. And in, concretely in 12, uh, 1230, uh, 30, uh, some set of monks actually completed the concordance of Bible. So essentially taking all the references from Bible and putting them in sorted order somewhere. And then for each of those, have a reference to the chapters, to the passages in, in Bible where they actually occur. And this enabled them to have much better discussions and to find things much more quickly. And this very same data structure is the same data structure that powers 90% of all the searches out there. This data structure is called an inverted index. What it is? It's a list of terms, a list of words that actually occur in, in the data set. So in this case, we have words like Django, Flask, Python, Jazz. And note that they're in sorted order. That's important. And then for each of those in the rows in our, in our case, we have the list of, in our case, files where those terms occur. And again, you can see that those are in sorted order. And that will be important. So what, how do we use this data structure for search? So if we want to search for Python and Django, we just find the two relevant lines. And finding those two lines is simple because uh, the, the lines are sorted. 
So we can immediately go to, to the Django line and to the Python line. And now what we have is two lists of documents, two posting lists is, is the proper term, uh, that we just need to merge. So we are merging two certain lists and we are outputting the documents that actually are uh, present in both, which is a fairly simple operation. To merge two sorted lists, to iterate over multiple lists at the same time, and just output anything that's, uh, that's in both, that's the, sort of, that's the sort of task that you might get at, during an interview. It's not that hard. Can get a little tricky when you have multiple, but it's really not that hard. And also, this data structure lends itself very nicely to further enhancements. So with this, as, as we have it now, it's safe to say that we can do AND and OR queries and anything like that. But if we add some more information into the data structure, we can do a lot more. For example, if we add positions, so for each, t for each document, we add what was the position of the word. So we can see that for file one, Python was the fourth word. And we see that for, that for file two, web was the second word. And why this is useful is because this actually enables us uh, to have the condition on the merging phase a lot more sophisticated. We can do phrase searches. So if we look for the phrase Python web, which means word Python, followed by the word web, it's easy. We do the same merge process, except in this time, we take the, uh, we take the position, the offset of, of the word into consideration. So we only consider it a match if the offset, if the difference between the two numbers in the two diff for the two different words is just one, and plus one in this case. So that's, that will mean that I can, do, I can do phrase searches. So even though I'm only indexing individual words, and when doing searches, I don't care how big the documents are. I go for the words directly. So it doesn't scale linearly, it scales much better. And just by adding more information, you can even do searches across words and even search across relations. So you can immediately see that the offset doesn't have to be one. I can, for example, say Python followed by web, and there should be at most 10 words in between. So I can do proximity searches. I can do a lot more with that, and, and we'll, we'll discover a little bit today of what, what, everything, what everything that I can do is. But in the end, it's just the inverted index, the, which, is a, which is a very nice data structure, and it is how I can do it, what I have to put in to be able to get it out. So this was a, a brief introduction into how inverted index works. And the, the important thing to remember is you're always just merging sorted lists, which is a, which is a very, very efficient operation. One you, of course, once you have uh, the inverted index on disk or in memory even better. So how do you get there? How do you, how do you build this data structure so that you can then search very effectively? Hopefully, I've already convinced you that you can search very effectively with an inverted index. So now I'll, let's see how you actually build it. So let's assume that we have, uh, that we have a, a phrase, a sentence, or let's call it a document for, for our use case. And this is some, surely a sentence that you've never heard of uh, before. Django is a high-level Python web framework that encourages rapid development and clean, pragmatic design. So this is, this is the document. This is the raw text that we have on the input. And now we need to split it into, into words. So how do we do this? I've, I've, already, I've already provided you with the, with the result, and you can see that there are several surprising things. For example, uh, I've omitted some words. 
I don't care about a word uh, like is or a or and or that. They're way too common. Chances are that every single document will have those words. So there is no point in me actually indexing it because it will, it will bring nothing to the table. So instead, as a form of an optimization, I'll just, I'll just leave them out. No one cares. So that's one thing that I've done. Uh, the other things uh, uh, I've done here is everything is lowercase because the inverted index that, that does exact matches. So if, you, if somebody searches for lowercase Django, they should still be uh, able to find this document, right? And then also what I've done is I've normalized the words. So you can see that in the text I have encourages but what I'm actually going to index is just encourage. And this is to sort of allow for the, for the morphology of the language, for the different shapes of the words. Because jumping and jump is, is the same word. When I search for jumping, I want to find a document that just mentioned uh, jumps or jumped. So this is a process called stemming, where you actually take the word and you find just the stem just the core of the word that defines the meaning and omit all the grammatical constructs around it. And one last thing I'll mention is you see that for, for rapid, I also index it as fast. So you can see that the inverted index doesn't necessarily have to contain the same words in the same shape or even the same number of words as the original document. So I can, I can just index Additional, additional words, for example, fast. So when somebody uh, searches for uh, fast development as a phrase, they should, they should find this document. Even though <clears throat> the creators of Django have a very, very large vocabulary and they're not limited to simple words like fast, most of the people who search are. So we need to, we need to take that in, into account. So, this process is called analysis. Uh, the, the example that I give here was composed of, of, these, of these steps. Uh, split it into tokens or into words. Remove the ones that I don't like. Lowercase everything. Uh, do the stemming. Apply the synonyms. And this is a, this is a very inter interesting and important process for doing, for doing uh, searches. It uh, varies different languages. It varies for use case because in some use cases you want to do the analysis. In some cases you just want to index the raw value as it is. Uh, in some cases you might want to do completely different type of analysis. For example, you want to index every, uh, every three letters as, as they follow each other, so uh, so-called engrams. So you can do partial matches. And Stuff like that. So it's all de defined as part of the analysis. And it happens at index time. So when a document comes in, we apply this analysis process to get the, get the results, to get the tokens that we will then put into the inverted index. So once you change it, you, ha you need to re-index your data. So this is the one, one drawback of the, of the search engines. If you, if you change any of this, this high-level configuration, you need to re-index your data. The other important thing to keep in mind is that this needs to be applied for the queries as well. Because it's all nice and well if I lowercase everything in my document, but if I then don't lowercase the query that comes in, it will again never match. If I don't remove the stop words from the search, so I try to look for, for the word the, which I haven't indexed. It will fail. So I need to apply the same process for queries as well. So this, is, uh, this was analysis. This is a process of actually uh, taking the text and splitting it up and populating the inverted index. During this, during this process, we, we got all the tokens we obviously have the document ID to put into, into the posting list. So now we have all we need to actually build the inverted index. So what else, what else is part of the search? 
What else is the major difference between, between filtering and, and searching? Well, the biggest one probably is relevancy. Because when you, do, when you just do a filter, when you just do an I like query, or I contains in our case, it will tell you which document actually contained this word, but it will not tell you like, which contained it more or better, it, because it doesn't have any concept of, of relevancy. We do. There's a science behind it, even. So uh, this, is a, this is a formula from, from Lucene, one of the most widespread search libraries out there, uh, the uh, library that powers both Elasticsearch and Solar, uh, and can even be used uh, raw. There is even a, a Python interface to Lucene. And this is, a, this is a scary formula, but it's actually not that difficult to, to wrap your head around it when you, when you break it apart. And the parts are, the most relevant part is in, in the middle. It's the, it's, the, it's the sum of it. And that's taking into account TF and IDF. You'll find a TF-IDF formula in, in the middle of any relevancy formula out there. TF stands for, do, uh, for term frequency, and IDF stands for inverse document frequency. So the TLDR version is, uh, the higher the TF, which means that we have found multiple occurrences of the term in the document, so the word is repeated multiple times in the body or in the title, the higher the score. And IDF means the um, more common the word, the lesser the score. So it's a balancing act. Because if I find a word five times, but the word is contained in almost every other document out there, that's not really saying much. But if I find a word twice that is only contained in 5% in of my documents, that means that it's a, it's a, it's a good match. So uh, that was just a, just a mathematical expression how to, uh, how to put this down in a, in a formula. What we in, uh, also take into account is the length of the field. Because the assumption is that if we find something in the title or in a tag or something like that, it's probably more relevant than if we just find it somewhere in the middle of the body. Because there's a lot of things in the body. So the chances that of our word being there are higher. So we need to take that into account. So this is, this is relevancy. This is, this is a very uh, helicopter overview of, of how relevancy works and how we can, how we can actually do that. We, can, we have the access to, to, the, uh, to the term frequency because that's part of the inverted index. And we also have the, the access to the document frequency, which means how many documents actually contain this term. Because that's just the length of the posting lists for that term. So we don't need to do any lookup. We have direct access to those numbers, so we can calculate the, the relevancy, the score, very quickly. So that's all, that's all you need to, to build a full text search. You can implement this in, in Python, and, and uh, you, can use, you can use Redis for your data storage, and it will work just fine. But this is not all there is to search. We've just built the, the, uh, the search bar, the, the, the text input. There are other parts on this, on this uh, page that we might consider part of the search and, and are definitely part of the search experience. So let's look at them very, very briefly. The first one is highlighting. When I, when I search through a book and I find the word Django somewhere in there, I cannot return the whole book and just tell the user, here, I found it somewhere in there. That's not very useful. That's not very nice of us. So instead, what we can do is we can just uh, con uh, return fragments. <coughs> sort of, I've, I found it in, in, the, in the fifth chapter on the, on the second paragraph, on the second sentence, and this is how the sentence looks. So that's a process that's called highlighting, because I can also, in that fragment, I can also highlight, uh, highlight the, the text. And that's done, again, easily just by sort of augmenting the inverted index to also contain the offset, byte offset, of the original, uh, of the original term. So, for, for example, for the word fast, which is nowhere in the text, by the way, I, the 
thing that I index is fast, and I index the offset, which is 60 to 65. So then when I have a match on the word fast, I'll just reach into, into the text, into the document, and retrieve anything around the byte 60 to 65, and I'll, I'll, put, I'll put the HTML emphasis tags around the 60 to 65 uh, characters. So again, very simple, very simple operation. I just go somewhere, I retrieve a byte offset, and in uh, precisely specified bytes, I, in, I input uh, some HTML markers, and that's all I need for highlighting. And the last one we have, uh, we have time for is my, my favorite one, and that's facets and filtering. So on the left side, on, on GitHub, for example, or if you're, uh, if you're ever looking for something on Amazon or something, uh, you have the breakdown by, by different things. On GitHub, it's breakdown by type. So is this a repository? Is this a code? Is this a user? And you have a breakdown by languages. And for each of those, you, you also have a little visualization, like how many uh, doc, uh, repositories for in the Python language have I found? how many in, in Ruby or JavaScript. And this is something that's called a facet or an, or an aggregation. And this is the part, if you remember from the beginning, this is the part about exploration. This is something that enables you to uh, explore what's in your data set without uh, you having to know beforehand. If you're looking for Django, you have to know that you're looking for Django. But now, if you've searched for Django, you immediately see that majority of the repositories that mention Django are written in Python. And you can see it, you can see it right there. <coughs> what then you can do is you can click on the Python and have it filtered to only contain the repositories for, uh, for Python. So how this works under, under the cover is we have a feature called uh, aggregations, and this part is specific for, for Elasticsearch, other search engines do it slightly, slightly differently, but the functionality is, is in all of them. So we have two different types of aggregations. We have buckets and metrics. So buckets are those that actually uh, define, define the groups of, of the documents. It's, it's what you would put, you could say that it's something that you would put in the group by in, in SQL. So for example, you can have a group by language type or you can have a group by, uh, by geodistance, or you can have a, a, a group by month. So that's how you, define, how you define the buckets. And note the interesting part is you can nest those buckets. So you can uh, define a, a bucket per language, and for each language you can define a bucket per month. So in one query you can actually get the, the different distribution in time for different languages. And then inside these buckets, you can, you can ask for certain metrics. Just the count of the documents, how many documents fell into that bucket, or what's the average value of a, of a certain field, or something more, uh, more sophisticated. And uh, we've already seen facet and navigation, how it can be used. The other way how this can be used is to actually just visualize it, because this is, uh, this is Kibana, by the way, it's just a JavaScript application that serves data off of Elasticsearch. And it's just doing aggregations and visualizing them. So you can see the, the, the time series, they're just a date histogram. So uh, basically, everything is split by, uh, by time. In this case, I believe it's like five minutes. And within five minutes, it's split between the four or five different types of, of the request in this case. And then all you need to do is you just need to, you just need to filter. So if somebody clicks on something, you add a filter. And filter is, again, using the inverted index, but in this case, there is no, uh, there is no analysis, there is no, uh, there is no nothing. So it's just an exact match. And because it doesn't contain also any score, it's very fast and very cacheable. And that's it for now. We ran out of time a little bit. I'm sorry for that. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm not, do we have any time for questions? Yeah. We, we do have, have time minutes. for questions, so I'll be happy to answer any of your questions.